everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to Behind the Scenes. Welcome back to Behind the Dads. I'm getting out of dad costume. Behind the Dads. But here in their carefully curated aesthetic is folklorist. Uh, what did we say earlier? What was the adjective we used to describe you on Twitter? The intrepid Emmy Papa Eddie. Oh, I think um, impeccable. Impeccable. Okay. Impeccable. I yes. like intrepid though. It makes me think of Star Trek. So. The 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 uh, Voyager, yeah. the Voyager himself, Emmy Papa Eddie. Um, mm -hmm. Emmy, you ready for this uh this interview, right quick? Sure. Yeah. Let's cool. chat a let's, little bit. Let's chat a little bit. And uh, like always. Emmy, if you uh, if you like the questions I ask, uh, if, if anything makes you chuckle or go, oh God, I can't believe you you thought of that. Don't thank me. Thank the impeccable, intrepid, intrepid Folkwise interview sleuths who put together these uh, these interview questions. And as always, if you've got some more uh, questions for Emmy, send them to us at folkwise13 at gmail.com or ask them in the chat, and Daisy will see them. But first off, I have a first question for you, Emmy, if you're ready. Okay, ready. You, uh, this has already kind of come up. Uh, like the chat was going nuts when you talked about your uh, your your bio a little bit there. But um, we've had people on the stream define myth, define folktale, define legend, define foodways. But we've never had anyone get in the weeds and define material culture. What do you think? Uh, how do you define material culture for people? Um, so usually by the time I'm describing material culture to somebody who is not already talking to me at like an AFS bar or something like that yeah. is, uh, we've talked a little bit about folklore, which I always just use, you know, creative expression in small groups. And then the extension of that is, you know, the material objects. I like to make a distinction between sort of like verbal and tangible with the awareness that both of them kind of like inform each other. Mm. But material culture is kind of anything that you can see like the hand of individuals who are participating in a greater social culture. And for me, I'm really interested in costume and dress stuff that has to do with the decorative arts and a lot of stuff that's very heavily sort of gendered as feminine and thus has been sort of uh, left off the historical record or, you know, just, you know, people don't really care about because it looks like frilly women stuff or, you know, uh, likewise children's material culture too. Like that pointy S that everybody yes. drew on their desk in middle school. Yeah, school. Yes. Yes. we all knew it. The S. The S. Okay, right, somebody draw it in the chat. Floor. I think there's a way. I tried it before. <laughs> oh, you can draw it in ASCII art in the chat. That would be awesome. Okay, Emmy, Emmy, that leads me into <laughs> my next question. In perfectly, I'm gonna try. That leads Daisy, get on it. Okay. okay, that leads me perfectly into my next question, which is basically <laughs> uh, speaking about dress and costume. We we just uh, played a game about a hot dad date and a hot dad. Um, and there are all these different ways, like uh, uh, tangible, uh, as you said earlier, ways that like you could you could uh, uh, understand uh, kind of who the dads were just by looking at them. Uh, as chat said, hire the sweater, hire to God. But um, uh, apart from costumes, get you on know, like everyday dress. How do we express ourselves through dress on an everyday basis, according to a material culture scholar such as yourself? Okay, I mean, essentially, like today, most of us don't make our own clothes. That's not true for everybody. We've got people out there who are using their spinning wheels and making the yarn and then making the sweater and like all the way super cool. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I'm really interested personally in like sort of doing uh, like assemblage or bricolage, finding like thrift store clothes that. I like the patterns of, but that don't fit me. And I cut them up and I make them into new outfits. Um, but everyone is doing this in a smaller fashion with what's already available through them, chiefly through fast fashion these mm -hmm. days. Like, you know, your Sheen, your Forever 21, your Zara, whatever. Um, so as we kind of move through the world, we are either actively or passively like gathering all of this material that we then combine using our own sense of aesthetic and also like sort of there's a functional aspect to material culture a lot of the time because when you're dressing yourself, it's not just to present yourself, especially in the daily way. It's also, um, you know, like, oh, I ha it's it's 
hot outside, so I'm going to wear shorts, or um, I'm going to go sit in a hot place outside, and I want to make sure that the back of my legs are covered so I don't have, like, that metal, like, uh, wicker <sighs> basket on the back of my knees yep. when I stand up from the restaurant table, that sort of thing. So, mm, that's everyone. Everyone is being creative in the way that they dress themselves every day, even if they're not being um, particularly visually innovative to us, you know? Yeah. Good answer. Good answer. Um, can you, can you tell us, uh, can you tell the chat a little, oh yeah, I'll get my peach tea white claw. <laughs> Dad hours. Can you uh, uh, tell the chat a little bit about uh, your work with the Burlesque Hall of Fame? Uh, certainly. So, Originally, I sort of was interested in the Burlesque Hall of Fame as a site um, because, one, I was really interested in the costumes of burlesque. Mm -hmm. um, I started to get to know some performers who were living and working in Bloomington, Indiana, while I was at school at Indiana University. And um, while I was at school, I was also working at the Mathers Museum, which is now a new fusion museum. They did, like, the <laughs> Dragon Ball Z thing, and now oh, wait, they're, wait. like, a bigger museum, but... How to work like do it, do it. There we go. We just all right, anyway. Okay. That's harder to do anyway. <laughs> than you think. Um, it's really hard to do. Oh, yeah, to sync up, but anyway. Um, so I was interested sort of in how uh individuals preserve their own narrative and like the importance of representing sort of yourself in these spheres, aka museums that like. Mm -hmm have for a really long time been the collections of very wealthy people, of very privileged people, of people who kind of perpetuate um, systematic oppressions, even when they're trying to be, um, you know, like celebratory of like other cultures, usually ones that they kind of colonized. Yeah. Anyway, Burlesque yeah. Hall of Fame isn't like that. Um, it's what I consider, or this term that I've like, I don't know if I've coined it, but I can't find it anywhere else. I call it emic interpretation, which is where like a member of a group, a folk group, a marginalized community, any sort of like um, collective of people, um, this is going to give outsiders of the group uh, interpretation, which is like museum words for mm -hmm. like sort of informative explanations um, that are making like greater salient points towards the hopes of, you know, people maybe doing something with that knowledge once they leave the museum or the nature trail or whatever. Um, yeah. And so Burlesque Hall of Fame was originally founded by Jenny Lee, who was actually um, the founder of the first labor union for strippers in mm. the United States. Mm. So that's the Exotic Dancers League, um, also known as the EDL. And I think I sent Daisy a picture of her. Jenny Lee noticed that there was a failure to institutionalize sort of like the art and history of striptease, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, kind of the central part of burlesque that I'm interested in. And her collection grew through the 60s, the 70s, and by the 1980s, she had created this roadside attraction out in Hellendale, California, out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, wow. um, you know, it's halfway between Vegas and LA, which is the desert. and um, since then, it has been uh, – Jenny, unfortunately, passed away in 1990, and the collection has gone into the hands of a lot of different people. But uh, the people who run the museum today, the uh, programs director, the curator, are people who perform burlesque. So uh, for me, it's really important to find an example of how um, – people are choosing to represent themselves in an institutionalized space using sort of the language of institutions, which could be seen as sort of like oppressive language, but towards the end of sort of like swaying the greater population to a more like humane and respectful sort of understanding of people who aren't represented well in mainstream culture. Wow. That was uh that that was a great answer. It's so amazing good. because I'm also looking <laughs> yeah. at like my next three questions and how you got to all of them. Oh, I'm not yeah. gonna lie, because like next question, next question <laughs> was uh, how do you center the stories of women, the working class, and of a stigmatized uh, profession to be explicit stripping, which is just a quote of yours that I appreciate. Um, but I feel like I feel like if you were, I mean, you could say more about that. Uh, 
Uh, is there more? But, you could say more about that, right? Yeah, I can. So, I mean, generally yeah. speaking, we can kind of understand just as the small group, what are we? There's 20 of us here now. We mm-hmm. know just from our own experience, this in a very puritanical culture, at least in the United States, I don't mean to assume that everyone on the stream is like US based, but like, we got a you know, Canadians, we've driven past like, well, I'm, you know, yeah. all. God save the queen. Whatever. It's the same problems for us here and there, yeah. culturally at least. But um, mm-hmm. you know, there's it's a taboo job. It's something yes. that in uh, pop culture and in the media, these women are usually treated as disposable in like true crime sort of scenarios, mm-hmm. or in comedy, they're looked to be um, you know, sort of like disposable in a different way. Um. Mm. <clears throat> you know, kind of like frivolous, empty, vapid, like they're not real women. They're the foils to mothers, daughters, wives, which is kind of like society's expectations. So the reason that I think that the working class element of burlesque and striptease in particular is so important to pay attention to is because this is a job that it makes sense that a patriarchal capitalist culture would demonize. Mm -hmm. Because it is one by which a woman or like a femme, a fab person or just someone who finds their way to presenting feminine because there's a lot of a lot of trans women who do burlesque yeah. as well, like historically. Um, uh, it's a way by which you only need your body to make money. You only need your body and maybe one dress and a G-string and some pasties. And like, yeah, you can spend thousands of dollars on that. But historically, that was a way that a lot of women escaped serious abuse and serious sort of, um, I mean, it doesn't even have to be like, like danger scenarios, just like, how else would you get out of being the drudgery of being a housewife yeah. in the 1950s? You know, yeah. like there's these expected societal roles. So these people who are transgressing, um, that story is not just important, important from like a gender and a labor perspective, but also I think for people who view themselves as outside the bounds of sort of the dominant cultural narrative of what's mm-hmm. acceptable for behavior and um and like for your life, because they're also entertainers. And I think that that's something that I've like struggled with a lot. Uh, if I had known when I was 19 that I could just go and be an artist and like that was something I was allowed to do. It's like a first generation like immigrant child that like I never would have gone through academia. I wouldn't have gone through this rigor. It's important for people to know that it's not just a pipe dream to do something that is purely based on making people happy and on creating art and um, living a life that is exciting and beautiful for you. So. Well, um, fantastic. And that actually leads me to something. The, the end of that especially leads me to something I really, I really want to ask. And um, I'm going to, try to lean this way so everyone can see the the painting over my shoulder as well um but uh because you mentioned if you were uh like you know if if you knew you could just be an artist that is to say yeah yeah that's a that's a that's an emmy original uh if uh you had mentioned if you knew you just if you just be an artist you would have pursued that but how has being a folklorist uh influenced your artistic output or expression I would say that it has been one of the most, like, important and, like, transformative sort of perspective shifts because it allowed me to see that, like, yes, there is art as, like, an occupation, Mm -hmm. but that I can also still, you know, this is me, let's say, like, six years ago, who's, like, in the depths of, like, just doing PhD, like, I'm going to do academia, whatever fever dream I was in the midst of. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But, like, that... That everyone's life has room for art, that yes. everyone's life already incorporates creativity, whether it's a mom who like is drawing a little note in the lunchbox for their kid, or whether it's someone who's dressing up really elaborately to go to a costume, not to a co- wearing costumes to conventions or just for Halloween. Or even someone who arranges, you know, their hair and their their clothes really well to go to church on Sunday. That there's all these different ways 
um, that people, yeah, are already doing art and, um, yeah, and just, like, allowing me, I think, the grace to see art in everything and not just stuff that, like, you know, I might not have been as interested in, like, weird car modifications or, like, (laughs) their collection of bumper stickers or, like, whatever dangly yeah. things they put on cars cars is not like immediately what comes to mind but now driving around town like i cannot be bored anymore in part thanks to folklore because all i can do is think about where did these people go where's the market for like that crazy sticker i've okay can i tell you the best car sticker bumper sticker i saw recently i'm gonna do it Please. anyway um <laughs> um so i'm sure we're all familiar with no step on snack the um the yeah. yellow flag that says the, "Don't the, tread the on Gazden, me." I don't the know, Gazden whatever. Flag, yeah. Weird. Weird. In- yeah. So, fuck not, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not really into her, but the one I saw, <laughs> I loved. It's the yellow plane and the bl- the black snake like curled, but instead of the snake's head, it has the head of the mask, the Jim Carrey character, and it says the um, caption says. Somebody stomp me. Oh my oh hell yeah. Oh my this god. This is so awesome. And only 90s I mean, kids will remember. Everything you just said is like yeah, fucking yeah, life affirming. Is like, yeah. The same reason <laughs> Yeah, and like the same reason that I like folklore and the same I reason that I have a folklore as Twitch as like show. A, yeah, you just you summed the, me up. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and it's it, it's like I I like that folklore makes me think about the world that way. I like to notice and wonder, as Jeannie Thomas told me to do in my mm. in my undergrad, um, or my, my undergrad, my master's program at Utah State. She said, "Notice and wonder," because you're always doing that anyway. And so there's it gets so much more interesting when you notice all the little things that people are doing, make them part of a community. So just like you're noticing all the little stuff that we're doing, mm-hmm. that's like our artistic expression, like unfolding all the time i always i used to always think of it as like that's the thing that somebody taught us how to do that we're just doing automatically and that that's a marker of our community or the communities that have touched our lives and i feel like it's like same same art community like i i like the way that you framed that because it's true it's like we're constantly being creative in ways that we're told aren't creative but really are and i think that's so cool speaking of constantly being creative should i get the painting off the wall if you so desire. Do you, do you, I actually don't really... I remember that it's like creepy children it's that creepy I did something children. to, but I don't really... This is... I, I this do was love creepy so, children. Back when I had an office job, this was in my office, and now this is in my home office, but Emmy painted this uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, and it is... Uh, I'm far away from the mic. Talk about it. <laughs> Okay, cool. So yeah, so this was kind of a, see, I, I still do these. It's very popular and it's kind of an upcycle art where you find a painting in a thrift store and then you paint and add to it. So I thought that these children who I don't know if they look more Victorian or more Georgian or more Edwardian, <laughs> I'm not a costume historian, um, but uh, they looked creepy. So yes. I decided to paint the church little, in the little, background the of the painting. Man. I made it on fire. So they're they're arsonists. That's the idea. Very much. Um, I'm putting this back on the wall. Thank you, Emmy. Love it. Oh my gosh, someone had this cool. in their house growing up. <laughs> <laughs> And that's that's behind uh, that's that's been behind me the whole stream, people. Uh, I don't know if anyone has noticed the house on fire behind me. Um, I have a I have a next question that kind of builds off of these themes. Okay, when when you created your when you created your championship winning drag persona JJ Slade, how do you develop? Uh, like the world building and backstory of of your persona. Um. Well, it's a little difficult to to say that there's necessarily like backstory, just because I don't. Pref- there's not really like an ongoing narrative, as so much there is this ongoing sort of revelation of this character that is performative part of me. So kind of looking back, I can start to see what are the trends sort of in my creative output, which at times has been 
uh, something that was like commissioned or requested of me either from performing in a competition or um, from uh, uh, being requested. Like I had, yeah. I'm not really a bit, I'm a Star Trek fan, but I got requested to be in a Star Wars show. So I made myself a Darth Maul costume, which why did I pick that. Darth yeah. Maul? Because she looks like a bad bitch. That's so that's true. what I wanted to look like. Valid. Um, but that kind of, is like a a quality of some JJ personas is like very like femme fatale. Mm. I also have a, a lot a lot of sort of legally blonde um like uh like pretty in pink but not the Molly Ringwalds more gentlemen prefer blondes like I'm a Marilyn type. You know what I mean? I you know, I'm definitely a blonde. JJ is a blonde. There's this kind of like emphasis on hyper femininity, and um, I guess what I would con consider this idea that again I don't know if it's like a thing I made or a thing that I just labeled and someone else calls it something else, but essentially it's a this idea that pink is punk. So the idea that in a patriarchy anything hyper feminine is counter to that dominating sort of ideal and is thus like really subversive. So JJ for me is about a way to compartmentalize my sort of intentions towards mm. hyper femininity and my great love for dressing up and for sort of adorning in the traditional like girl woman way, yeah. but by taking it to um taking it to a point where it, it's only what I'm getting paid to do. Like, I don't like that I'm forced by virtue of having breasts and a vulva to look a certain way and move a certain way in mm -hmm. the world. Like, that icks me. But if I can do it on stage, guess what? I'm, like, really super good at looking, like, super beautiful. It's really yes. fun. So I like having that agency and that shift in, in a performance art helped i think okay then that changes the way i'm going to ask this next question okay 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 so yeah. if you're saying a part of the like drag persona like emerges in performance then i am editing the way i'm going to ask this question okay there's a running joke on the channel and i'm going to post this in the chat because i feel like it's important to see see uh how styled the spelling is but there's a running joke on the channel about my future drag persona which is phase spanx i posted it in the chat so you can see how it's spelled and phase spanx is a uh based on phase banks and also like other abusive esports people is like the um uh what i have so far is that she is uh like the landlady, the verbally abusive landlady of like an esports hype house. So here's how I want to ask this: What song should I perform as? What What's the first song I should perform as as Faze Spanx, the uh, emotionally abusive esports landlady? Okay, so I think that you should probably do um, J Lo. I ain't your mama. I imagine that these <laughs> dudes don't really take a super good care of your um, house, of nope. your apartment that totally you own. Not. You know what I mean? And yeah. they're they're living there. They're Cans getting it bang filthy. Everywhere. Yeah. They do not clean the bathroom. Mm -mm. And so you're just like, I ain't your mama. You know, like you come through and maybe there's like a little bit more of a comedic intro whereby you're like, cute boys are always gaming or whatever. And, and then, yeah. I'm not going to clean up your room, adults. I don't know. Yeah, no. The the face space <laughs> lore grows. Thank you very much. Uh and and uh the whenever face space inevitably happens, it'll it'll show up on the it'll show up on the YouTube. All right. Um oh, uh, I mean. Time for some funzy questions. I have to address ready? Wait, what do you have to address? I have to, can I address one really fun I have to address one really fun comment from Gerg23, who is also a folklorist. Um, can we have a drag show at AFS sometime? I want to have a Henry Glassing inspired drag persona. That's, that's just how I, I play just Among Us. I need to add that comment to, <laughs> that's, the, to that's this energy because character. it's really good. That's just Among Us, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, ready for some fun questions? I was questions just going to say, I think the AFS. Wait. I think the drag speak. show is just like. It, it's the. Um, it's the croning kind of. But I, guess. I was going to say, I, was gonna say I think yeah, it's kind of the croning, but 
<laughs> the thing that's closest to it, yeah, is definitely yeah. the croning, though. I would say that one thing that has been missing from AFS as, like, an event, in my mind, is an excuse to dress up, like, heavily. So if there could be some sort of, yeah, like, formal masquerade element... That way, if people wanted to do, like, more drag, like, fantasy, or they just wanted to be, like, glamour, 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 both of those things, well, both of those things are fantasies, right? Just, mm -hmm. like, yeah. some of it's more queer. Yeah. But I would <laughs> love to see... All right. Fun questions. Uh, being a Floridian, what is your hottest of takes on Florida, man? <laughs> um, I will respond with... Something that my friend and neighbor, he lives two streets down from me, says about Florida when we go to the beach. We go to the beach, and he stands at the edge of the water. <sighs> the edge of America. So... <laughs> edge of America. I think that Florida's a really strange place because it is still not for very much longer like due to the incredible rate of development unfortunately that our state is going through but mm -hmm. um like we have incredible nature and wildlife that is much different than sort of like the iconic american like uh you know rocky mountains majesty like that sort of image we have really difficult nature we have flying cockroaches we have spiky palmettos we have poisonous snakes in the water and the grass we've got crazy hurricanes and i think that um it's kind of like this twisted cowboy mentality mm. of people down here it's not the wild west but it is definitely it's the feral like, southeast it, it is the feral southeast and that unfortunately includes like you know, capitalism running mm -hmm. wild mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some real unfettered people with big pocketbooks who are looking to exploit the natural resources um, really at the um, at at the cost of, of people who live here and, of yeah. course, just the environment and whatever. Yeah. Hate them. Next but question. yeah, Florida Man oh. is like legit. That exists. We're weird. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, Emmy, famously, in tw fam world famously, in 2014, you breathed new life into a dead meme when you came to my birthday party dressed as, hello, this is dog. Uh, if you were to come to a meme-themed costume party in 2021, Sorry. which dog would you dress up as? Oh, I would have to be a <gasps> dog meme? I, okay. I was just assuming Ooh, you'd be a dog you know meme. Which, okay, can I give you one dog meme answer and one not dog meme answer? Because I think just for the sake of dressing up, I would probably want to be like Patrick with the eyelashes and the fake nails. Have you guys seen her? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then for the dogs... I would want to go in a couple's costume with somebody. What One of us is looking like maybe like construction hat dog and the other one has like a manicure and the meme is uh, my hands look like this so hers can look like this oh my I don't god know if you've yes seen those, but like the dog manicure i love that one okay <laughs> that would be so good nailed it okay, okay oh, nailed nailed, forward. nailed clawed it um okay and um this, 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 uh, I can give you like a second to think of this, or maybe you have a top three off the top of your head, but top three favorite burlesque performers and why? Historical or contemporary? Either. <clears throat> I'm going to go with contemporary, go and it. I will go with people who I see a lot on social media and who have relationships to the burlesque hall of fame, I think it's a good idea. Um, Sounds good. like technically my favorite burlesque performers are like people that I personally know, like those are my favorite burlesque performers, but from like 
uh, like a star perspective, I think that it is undeniable that, you know, Jeez Louise, the honey badger of burlesque, um, is one of the most important performers that we have right now. I think that she and um, her partner, Lola Vanella, just became in tandem burlesque, uh, burlesque's most important, like number one. Mm-hmm. There's a 21st century burlesque poll that burlesque performers do every year. Um, I also am a really big fan of Frankie Fictitious, who has been really good on TikTok this past Panini. And cool. she's actually our current reigning queen of burlesque. And I got to see her crowned in 2019 at the Burlesque Hall of Fame Weekender, which is this massive fundraiser for the museum that also doubles as, well, not doubles as, but it is the largest international burlesque festival. Frankie is like a really stunning performer, not only because of the way she performs with like outstanding artistry and um, just serious flair. She has like a three boob lady act. She has um, this act where she has like a lion's head and she reveals that she's like a sexy lady and really wonderful, just like performance. But um, she's also really invested and sort of like the history and the storytelling and was very close to some of our legends, mm-hmm. including Kobe Yee, who recently passed away. And a legend is the title that Burlesque Hall of Fame sort of ascribes to uh, the women who came before. So yeah. these are people who yeah. are performing burlesque in the mid 20th century. And then if I had to pick a third one, I'm just going to kind of go, ooh, hmm. They're not really just in the burlesque world. I freaking love Ramona Slick, like absolute icon, idolatry. Um, And they are a drag performer who incorporates a lot of burlesque. And they have a background actually as like a contemporary uh, strip club, like stripping person too, which is something that I really like. And that's the same with G's. And I'm not sure about Frankie, but. I think that that's a really important conversation when looking at neo burlesque is that for some people, this is a hobby. Um, and for some people, um, this is an extension of their actual occupation as professional erotic entertainers. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. tend to be really interested in um, the burlesque that's being performed by people who also do stuff that is sex work or sex work adjacent um, only because burlesque sort of classic striptease you know like fanfare and glove peels is the foremother of our contemporary gentlemen's club scene so being able to see the gap being bridged in that timeline on like one body and one sort of repertoire of an individual's artistry is really special and really rich for just you know contemplation Um, Daisy, uh, way to be the fastest fingers in all of Columbus, Ohio, and post every Emmy. one of the profiles that uh, Emmy mentioned in the chat. Yeah. So there you, yeah. And if you want to follow their, up, their website, links in chat, baby. Yeah. Um, links in chat. I posted their websites or their social media, whatever they seem to, to be the most popular yeah. and accessible through. So. Check it out. Daisy, why don't you queue up some of, while I transition into the next part, why don't you queue up some of these questions? I can ask you questions now. Um, So Gerg23, also folklorist in the chat, says, uh, question for Emmy. I love what you're saying and what I'm learning from you. And just wondering, do you have, do you ever have uh, to navigate the entrenched ideas of what folklore is and isn't? tradition Mm. with your work and the value of the museum collections that you work with? thinking they elaborate i'm thinking about people getting territorial about what folklore is based on ideas of tradition which can often exclude marginalized people uh, and their artistic expressions it seems to me that emmy's work queers or challenges what folklore is and what are folklore included in folklore museum collections so that was a big uh, a big network there but yeah yeah so i think what i'm taking away from that is the idea of like kind of querying what folklore is as sort of like the genres that get attended to and i think that when we focus on tradition historically it's been so much about sort of like 
the old fashioned ways of doing things. Um, but really, as m most of us know, or if you've done sort of like readings or have been guided in education, like on the subject of tradition is that it's not about a bounded object that you are preserving, but rather it is a process by which people are creating their traditions. Mm -hmm. And so I think the museum is a very active space in which people are creating narratives that can either stick with tradition or queer tradition. And, you know, in the case of the Burlesque Hall of Fame Museum, at least, they do a really excellent job of, um, well, first, of trying to not stay away from some of, like, the dirtier, like, scarier parts of burlesque history, which includes a really unfortunate but really serious connection to, like, minstrels, like, minstrelsy and minstrel shows in the United States, just because it was kind of another similar, like, lowbrow form of entertainment that was accessible to people of, like, lower classes. So um, there's a lot of that stuff that goes into um, sort of again, our consumptions of, of the exotic, of exotic dance, that there's a lot of racial issues, there's a lot of objectification of women, there's a lot of, you know, all of that is entrenched in this popular medium. And I think what can make that, it, okay, so it's also difficult, right? Because burlesque was at one point in time, pop culture. Burlesque was at one point in time, the equivalent of not like real housewives, but you know what I mean? Like that was the thing that you do mm -hmm. in your daily life. It wasn't yeah. seen as like your folk festival activity. Mm -hmm. um, but, <laughs> but, but there's still, it's what we were saying earlier, like there's folklore and everything. There's folklore that's happening between the people who work at the Jiffy Lube down the street for you. There's folklore with people who are working at the grocery store that you go to now. So I think, um, maybe just being a little bit, uh, focusing a little bit more on like that traditionalizing process, the people who are creating these narratives, whether they are traditional or whether they are like uh, more innovative or more representational if like a wider variety of people's views or whatever. But yeah, because it's also really important to see the ways in which like sort of old fashioned ideas or like, you know, racist ideas get perpetuated yeah. in our current tradition like in what ways do we continue the tradition of racism as a part of burlesque when we exotify uh you know women of east asian descent like dita von Tees for a while she has this opium den act which since i think the mid-2000s she's stopped performing but it was due to the backlash of her stereotyping mm -hmm. of marginalized group of women especially you know what i mean yeah. like i don't know just being aware i don't know i feel like i ramble i feel like i'm info dumping here but y'all know yeah. that's my deal that it, no it's great this dump. is this is fascinating it's what the people and want <laughs> i will i'll have a book i'll have a bonus question for when we come back from playing the game and the there's one other question that i think just fits really well actually into what you were saying and then we can take it to the game does that sound good okay um how so this is a question that was emailed to us how can folklore help uh get through the difficulties and chaos of life and how does the answer to that question connect to henry glassy's quote i don't study people i stand with them and study their creations wow. which i think is sort of what you were saying earlier but like how does folklore yeah this is like a full circle moment all of a sudden um how does folklore help people get through some of the trials and tribulations of life and what does that mean for standing with them as a person who studies that Ex cultural expression. Can I get one more time your succinct version? Sorry, I've got like a lot of. Yeah. No worries. The, the succinct um, question so that you we gave were at the end a... again. Yeah. Yeah, so the the question, like, said in a different way, um, so there's this a quote by Henry Glassy, I don't study people, I stand I with them and study their <laughs> creations. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somebody, somebody uh, uh, which quoted that like in their, in their calls, yeah. I bet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 probably. Um, so uh, how can folklore then help people get through the difficulties of life or challenges, chaos that comes our way? 
Um, and what does that mean as a person who studies that type of cultural expression? So like, what does folklore do with us when we're struggling? Like, how do we do help get help from folklore? Um, this makes me think a little bit about like other parts of just human life that are inexorable from our experience, such as the body. Ooh. Like our body is always there and is always like a part of us in our experience. And while some people, you know, there's obviously like people who have different differing abilities, but essentially our body is what allows us to continue like perceiving and engaging with the world. And folklore for me is like the social extension of essentially our body. So there's no sort of question of whether or not folklore can help us through trying times, but rather the mindfulness, the attention to, and the perception of folklore can be, I believe, a panacea in both a personal and a greater social way. Um, just like, I don't know, I like this image of of Henry, right? Like, okay, I, I don't study people, I stand with them in the study of their creations. Like, I am not judging everyone around me. I'm trying to, in a mindful, sorry, I've also been doing a lot of meditation because, like, my freaking anxiety has been out of control for the pandulce. And what does it mean to just have this wide view of the world in which you can just sort of absorb and appreciate and notice, um, you know, every part? of what's going on in your mundane life, being able to take joy in the small breakfast that you're making, being able to, you know, to get excited about somebody's pair of shoes or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that folklore is, and folklore for me now being a shorthand for the creative practices of human beings, like as a species, it is a completely, um, what is that called? It's a, I don't want to just say sustainable, but it is an infinite resource that humans mm. have. Like, we have a drive to create. We have a drive to connect to other people. And like, that's it, baby. What else are you going to do? Uh, Luomi has a lot to say also about drag in the chat if you want to scroll, but not like a specific question. Not a question, so just, feel free to just the two of you need to share while, a, while we explain. Yeah, the two of you need to share like a yeah, martini. You gotta hang out. You gotta hang out with yeah. 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 Uh, No, I mean, I mean, I mean like message. a shorthand. <laughs> though, a, though a shorthand reason is why we don't look at um, why we don't look at apprentices as like you know, the Archie Green Occupational Folklore Fellowship isn't going to someone who's doing, like, drag queen stuff mm -hmm. is because we don't think of drag as... It is neither folk nor art, you know, that it is actually just because it exists outside of the periphery. And now it's yeah. starting to become uh, more popular in, like, pop culture thanks to RuPaul. But, like, I think that's a really excellent example of, like, you should problematize some of the tr these processes of traditionalization. Because now we're getting a traditional mainstream view of drag that looks like cis men yeah. pretending to be conventionally attractive women. And that has never been the purpose of drag. That is one small tentacle of a really freaky octopus. So, I don't know. Taboo stuff. We don't look at it because we're still a product of our society. Dom, are you ready to explain? <gasps> yes, I am. Emmy, you ever Emmy, have you ever made a tier list? Uh, let me start over. Emmy, you've ever made a tier list? <laughs> No, I never made a tier list I'm just gonna before. Ask that again. Cool. Well, you kind of you kind of got at it earlier when we said uh uh when 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 we had a good date with Matt and we got to uh, S. But a tier tier list started off as a way to rank character choice in video games. Uh, but recently, especially on Twist, they have uh. Uh, they have uh, moved into uh, the realm of how to rank everyday things, which is why I, as a folklorist and gamer, love them. So we try to do a tier list with everybody on stream after we interview them, something they uh, are uh, uniquely qualified to have the right opinion about. Uh, and you already see where this is going. Um, <laughs> Emmy, I would like you to rank the the Sailor Scouts. Are you prepared for this? Um, yeah. I um, am. Or is there going to be, like, a review 
of them or I just need to like pull up like I want to make sure I remember their names because I know like Mer- Mercury, Venus, oh, whatever, okay. I'll Usagi. Pull Can I just say like I think Usagi's number one? I'll pull them I'll pull them uh one at a time for you and I can <laughs> yeah, I can I can run through them, especially because I know okay, spending, spending. I know I will I'll give I'll give hey, I'll give the English names for the chat, but like you already like you already uh alluded to uh emmy gets the japanese names the rest of you filthy casuals get the get the english names uh basically s is master class uh... s is master class d is barely passing uh if 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 someone is an object uh like abject failure we can create an f class uh but on a scale from s to date d we're going to rank the sailor moon characters are you ready yes all right okay let's start off let's start at the very beginning so like the a very good place to start. In, um, first off is Usagi. First off okay. is Sailor Moon. Ser- Serena, if you prefer, herself. And you already alluded, she's the very top. Where, Where is she going? S, right? You said that's the top? Top tier. S tier. Absolutely. Usagi up, up at the top. I don't know. Next up is uh, Ami. Next up is Mercury. Okay. Mercury. Ugh. I feel bad because I have a lot of extroverts in my life that I love, but like she's kind of a drip. So yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna put her at B tier. Okay, okay, cool. Um All right, all right, let's get to uh let's get to Venus next. S tier. S tier, okay. Sailor V, let's go. Now below below Sailor Moon. Yes. Sailor Moon number one. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Next, hit me with where are you putting where are you putting Sailor Mars? Where are you putting Ray? Uh, A tier. Solid A. Um, my okay. Jupiter is best girl. In my opinion, best girl. But where's she going? No, no, no. I was gonna say she's between Venus and Sailor Moon. <gasps> I love hell yes. Her. I like that she's the tall friend with the ponytail, and I like that. She cooks food for her friends. She's really nice. Absolute fuck yeah, let's go. Okay, Outer Senshi, you ready? Uh, where are we putting, yes, I am. Where are we putting your Raiders? I'm trying to remember the ones aside from the lesbian. Well, Ooh, let's start Haruka. right there. Haruka, where's she going? <laughs> um, okay, Haruka is going to go... She's going to go um, number two after Sailor Moon. Okay, super uh, hot. love a love a top heavy tier list. To be to be fair, um, not, no, no, no. there is only it's perfectly fine. I say Haruka's the only true top That's... on the top tier, probably. Damn. Next up, we got Neptune. You heard it here Neptune. first. <laughs> you heard it here first. The only top and top tier. Next up is Neptune. Okay, so this is Michiru. This is Michiru. So this is she Michelle. can go next to Mars, and actually, I want to pop. I'm gonna pop. Um, yeah, she's perfect there. And then if Venus can go in front of um, Mars. Okay, okay. I like I like the mid I like the mid tier list edit. Okay, I see I see it I see it. It's good. Let's yeah. talk about Pluto. Let's talk about Satsuna. Space time. Where's where's uh where's she going? Man, sweet powers, but like I can't really remember her, so Fair. like I'm gonna put her I'm gonna put her also on B with Mercury. Below Mercury. Yeah, because she's not even there as long as everybody else. Um, and then we've got uh kinda kinda goth girl, kinda bad girl for a while. What about Saturn? Saturn, yeah, Saturn's cooler, so she can also be on A, and she can actually go after Mars. She can go after Mars. Oh, after Mars this way? Is this crazy? I just don't hate... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You shouldn't. Yeah. You honestly shouldn't. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't hate any of them. It's like, it was hard to even do that to Mercury, you know? We got we got two left left on this tier list that was uh that 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 I found and uh it is interesting the the last two that made it onto this person's template that is the next up is Chibi Moon that is that is uh Chibiusa, aka Rini 
I don't know, in front of Mercury, but not higher. I For me, she gave me, like, Dawn vibes. If you guys are fans of Buffy the yeah. Vampire Slayer as well, like, I'm just like, why did we need the random little sister? I don't need the random little sister. She's kind, she kind of gave me, like, she's kind of like, uh, for X-Men fans, she kind of gives me, like, Kawhi Cable vibes. That that is a Probably. sentence someone has definitely said before, and uh the uh, last one okay cool she made it onto the list let's go I want to see where you rank her where's Chibi Chibi oh like the mm, well like cause that's kind of weird you know it's not yeah. just weird little uh she. Nah, she can just go right next to Chibi Moon. She can okay. go between Mercury and Chibi Moon. Above, 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 uh, what did you call Mercury? Mercury, a drip? You know. called her a drip? Oh, not bad. Yeah. Technical difficulties and uh, monsters, uh, Queen Barrel, etc. be damned. We made it through this tier list, and in the name of the moon, uh, they rank you. Fucking tearless prison power makeup. Amazing, amazing. There we go. Um, um big, before before we jump list. back in, yeah. Be before we continue to before we continue to jump back in to Dream Daddy and hang out and say goodbye to Emmy, do you want to plug the virtual burlesque Call of Fame? Yes. Uh, awesome, a fundraising event that's happening this year. I just posted. I just posted the link to it in the chat. But if you'd like to explain a little bit more about what that is, um, so that way people feel like excited and get involved with the virtual burlesque Hall of Fame event this year. If you want. No uh, Yeah, so essentially... I posted the link to um, it so people can check yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So, so the Weekender is like the major way that this museum sustains itself. Um, the pageantry of an actual performance was something that was uh, br brought up by the second person to sort of head the collection. Her name was Dixie Evans. She was the Marilyn Monroe of burlesque. She was a Marilyn Monroe striptease impersonator mm -hmm. who, uh, when the collection wasn't able to sustain itself anymore after Jenny's death, decided to put on this pageant as a way to draw attention to the collection, to the museum, and also to, in the early 90s, the kind of fading art of burlesque. Mm. Um, and so since then, it has grown to become the largest international burlesque festival. It is a really stunning production that is almost entirely volunteer run. And unfortunately, last year and this year, due to the fact that um, our most treasured sort of like people are our burlesque elders, we are not hosting yeah. the weekender in person. The whole purpose of it is to have opportunities for these women to connect with like young performers and do like oral history projects. They have panels that they give. There's a legends night where they get honored. And so to have a competition that would exclude or possibly harm them is not an option for this institution. Um, and so, you know, like they could put one on this year, but that's one of the things I also really like about BHOP is just like they're incredibly ethical in the way that they attempt to really like center um, the people who they care about in um, like in their programming practice, not just like in their narrative. So the virtual burlesque hall of fame weekender V Hoff is going to be a 48 hour extravaganza oh, yeah. of uh, digital performances that have been compiled and curated for you by the people who run B Hoff. Um, there is not a better way to see burlesque aside from live. Unfortunately, I do really think that you miss a little bit. Um, not having the live performance, but if you're going to see a digital virtual performance, this should be the one to see, um, just because it's going to be such a great representation of everything uh, that burlesque can be, from Neo to sort of like nerdlesque, where there's a lot of cosplay, to stuff that's very mm -hmm. like poignant and artful, and stuff that is funny and raunchy. You want to you want to see it all, and if you do, that's going to be through the virtual Hall of Fame, um, which Daisy has posted the link to. So. Hell yeah! Um, it's going to be awesome. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody GGs. Yeah, everybody GGs, GGs, GGs in the chat. chat. For Emmy. GGs in the chat for Emmy, everyone. Um, and we pride letters in the chat for Emmy. 